dismal, abysmal, weak, most underrepresented. These are the words uh, used to describe Latinos in film, how we're represented. These were quotes by Forbes, LA Times, IndieWire, et cetera. These words are extremely <clears throat> disheartening, hard to swallow. I want to know what you think, our esteemed adjudicator, Melissa Sue Lopez, joining us. Um, do you think that these are accurate or narrow um, or on point um, descriptions of how Latinos are represented in the filmmaking world? Tell me your thoughts. Um, I, re I really think they're on point. Um, I watch a lot of TV, I watch a lot of films, you know, for me to, to, to learn a little bit what's, what's happening, you know, in the industry and also to know there's rep representation for us. And I think they're on point and I keep seeing many TV series get canceled where there's Latinos like us. Absolutely. I agree. Um, you know, I'm, sharing with our audience as as I'm as we're having this conversation um, research that I did on film filmmaking basically the films from 2017 to 2020 is where where this data comes from there's one particular source um, that I'll share a little bit more about in a moment that it kind of everything all came back to this one particular study but probably basically for for anyone who doesn't know um, the representation of Latinos in on camera is between zero and 4% all across the board. And we're gonna get into what those numbers really look like um, broken down here in just a moment, but between zero and 4%. One of the most startling statistics that I read was that of a study of 1200 films, zero of those 1200 films had a part for a Latino that was a speaking part, a speaking part for Latino. So we may have been a gangbanger in the back. Uh, we may have been a maid, we may have been a prostitute, we may have been, you know, whatever, um, but we did not um, represent a um, speaking role on camera in 1200 films um, in this particular study. Um, and, you know, Melissa, I, um, you know, I've been doing films for 11 years and I, was not, um, I knew that the data that I found once I started this um, research was not going to be good. I mean, certainly, you know, I've been paying attention, but I didn't know it was going to be as um, um, abysmal as Is it kind of shameful? Is. Like, is it the war shameful? Like yes. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I, I, I think that's very accurate. Um, I'm gonna share just a little bit more information and then again, I'd like to, to talk about some things in, in, um, in a little bit more detail. Um, between 2018 and 2020, um, our statistics have actually gone down. At one point, mm -hmm. we were at 4.9% um, representation. Um, the last study showed 4.5%. So again, under 5%. I mean, it, again, we're just between that zero and that 4% all across the board um, of Latino film representation um, based upon 3,891 speaking characters. Out of those almost 4,000 speaking characters, Latinos represent less than 5% of that. Again, we're at, we're at an all time low. Um, a further breakdown, because you know, you may be saying, okay, ladies, well, I hear you, but I see some Latinos on screen, particularly Latinas, uh, which again, we're gonna get much more into gender in just a second. And, and you do, and I'm glad and hooray for them. And some of those are some of my colleagues who I've had the pleasure of working with and, I, and they're wonderful, kind humans and they're doing great work and they are doing everything that they can to bring integrity to those roles. So let me just pause before we talk about any other bad news and celebrate those. Please know that we love you. Um, Shout out Zoe Saldana and some others that that um, just I know so many that I can I can I can name um, and that are also not only just doing great artwork but they're doing great um, artivist and activist work um, America Pereira and so many and so let's please just take a moment to of course celebrate so many champions Eva Longoria many many others um, but let's talk about so well, let's talk about what roles we have been seeing on screen for the past few years. Um, while celebrating those things, let's also break a few things down. So of the 28% of, of those top build Latino characters, excuse me, Latino actors were portrayed as violent, nonviolent lawbreakers. So again, I'm not necessarily talking about the celebrities I just mentioned, but of those, um, you know, 28% of those were portrayed as lawbreakers of some kind, whether they be violent or nonviolent. 62% were portrayed 
um, as being involved in some sort of organized crime. 62% organized crime. So again, it, it's hard to celebrate um, sometimes when we do get on-screen roles or we do get speaking roles because again, what are, what are we speaking about? How are we being portrayed? 17% um, were portrayed as poor. 13% um, were portrayed as uneducated. A mere 4%, again, we're going back to the zero to 4% here, were, uh, were represented in thriving high-level STEM or STEAM careers. Um, so, you know, what, what saddens me about that, Melissa, is that what it tells me is that when someone sees um, a Latino on screen, and as we know, we as Latinas, we look every kind of way, dark skin, deep skin, beautiful, our melanin is all across the board, our hair colors across the board, all those kinds of things. But at the end of the day, when, when audiences are seeing Latinos on screen, their expectation must be low. And, and that's what I think really um, breaks my heart about, about this data that I'm sharing. And as we get into the, this conversation, the last thing that I want, Melissa, is for people to have a low expectation of what they're going to see on screen, how we're going to perform, how we're going to represent the community, um, what our day-to-day -day lives are really like, um, and, and, and all those kinds of things. Um, and, and as you know, you know, whether you're a filmmaker or a film consumer, I mean, we're all consume media, right? Mm -hmm. We have an expectation going into, um, you know, when we see something on screen or we, or we hear um, a Latino name or, or something like that, you know, what would you, what would you say as, as a filmmaker, um, you know, to that, what would your response be to just um, well, you know, that low expectation of us? Um, it has to do a lot with leadership. Look what, for four years, what a very top leader, I'm sorry, our, pres our past president said about us. Sure. You know, and I think that's where everything starts, you know, from the person that it's on top, how, how they see us, sure. how, because it's, I really, in everything I have encountered and seen, it's about who has the most power. And the one that has the most power is the one who controls. Right. And money talks, right? So money moves many things. Absolutely. <laughs> so for me, it's like, um, I'm so happy that hopefully things are gonna start a little bit, the changings. Yes. And like you said, many of Latino actors had started you know, have like tried to open doors for us. And I really thank them, you know, yes. because it's, it's, it's the hardest thing, you it know, to is. be able to, to change people's minds to, to society has taught us differently than what really it is sometimes. Absolutely. Well, and if I can interject really quickly, um, not to interrupt you, but I think that it's so important to talk about the actors that we talked about and to, and, and to you know, emphasize what you just said. But let's also talk about, um, and especially as it comes to, to leadership, um, leadership within the realm of the writers, the producers, the casting directors, all of that kind of thing. You know, um, and, and, and I do wanna obviously talk about writing because again, I feel like um, you're such a storyteller, um, whether it's from a documentary standpoint or a narrative standpoint or whatever, um, you know, the stories themselves are so important. Um, and I don't think that anyone can authentically tell our stories or portray our true characterization and help us avoid mischaracterization without um, there being Latinos who have created the table not just sitting at the table, but we've built the table where, and we're telling our stories, we're casting our characterization, uh, you know, of our people, all those kinds of things. Um, I wanna share some data on those things in a moment, but what were you gonna say, Melissa? Uh, I, the best example, okay? It's Zoe Sandala, right? Uh, you mentioned her. I love she her. portrayed one of the best singers ever, who, the black singer, um, and, they give her such a hard time. You know, she had to go, like right now I'm doing, to say, I'm sorry, it has been the, the most regret I have ever done in my career. Mm -hmm. I'm like, no, does people, uh, are they ignorant? There's a lot of ignorance yes. in this world because I'm like, 
us Latinos are black too. <laughs> Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. But you're right. There is a, a very narrow, yeah, understanding of that. And, and it's the same thing. I work for many of my films with my lead actress, uh, Lauren Escandon, and she's darker complicity, right? And, um, you know, for her to get parts was very hard for her. And, you know, uh, also because of her accent, you know, thick accent or this, but um, she has been having kind of like, you know, I think a difficulty to get into better roles for her. Sure. You know, she's right now doing amazing, doing some TV, TV, you know, series. But uh, I remember I saw a post of her on Facebook where she had her hair curly and she was this Latina, you know, like embrace it, embrace who you are mm -hmm. and really let's start. It's sad to say, but let's start educating people about our stories. Absolutely. You know, you and it to. takes those writers like you were talking about those, those stories don't don't be afraid to share your story because there's so many of us that are willing to come and tell your story, you know? And, and that's something that it, it, it kills me to know that someone that I dear love and care, you know, it's going kind of got through that, you know? Absolutely. And, and I'm, I'm just so happy that now, you know, she's embracing who she is and she's going with that thick accent. She's doing what's, you know, she's being herself and bringing those characters, you know, into the TV series. And, right. and, and the whole thing is that as I am mesmerized that don't are we Latinos the biggest? <laughs> We're the largest minority, yeah. Right. So Absolutely. I just don't understand why big studios and producers don't haven't seen that. I agree. And and I've always wondered that gap, which actually leads me to I, I was going to talk about this later, but it's it's actually on point right now. Um, oh, gosh. If I, yeah, here it is. I'm sorry. I, I just want to share on that note, um, not to sidetrack, but the irony of these statistics that we've only started to talk about is that um, the irony is that the um, that Latinos own 1.5 trillion, not billion, 1.5 trillion in U.S. buying power, as projected to rise to 1.9 trillion in over the next two years. The Motion Picture Association of America revealed that Latinos hold the highest movie-going rate amongst every racial and ethnic background American. Um, so that is the irony in, 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 in what you're saying, Melissa. Hey, um, I had the opportunity to work with Eugenio Derbez. Oh my goodness. One of the big actors in Mexico. Um, I, I helped him, um, you know, for him it was so hard in New York City when he was about a director, his directorial debut of Broadway, right? Yeah. And he was already, and he is still a big name. Yes. Even him had problems. You know, I remember sitting with him and he was tired of people just like people just thinking that the only thing he can do is comedy. Yeah. He wants dramatic he a great dramatic actor. Yeah. He can do it. You know, I, it's one of the persons I admire because I had the chance when you talk about hum humility mm -hmm. that uh, he is amazing on that, you know, and then. I remember I did Emociones and he came to my premiere of Emociones and he was like, what? You did this with this little camera on your own in New York City? And guess what? Later on, my tias in Mexico called me and they said, Eugenio is talking about you. And I'm like, what? And I said, I, can't, I have not been able to find the, where he says this, but what they told me is like, he said that he couldn't believe that he was in New York City and one Latina filmmaker did a future film and presented it. And him, who had, you know, all of this happening, you know, why, why he did it, like, why he hasn't jumped to do it himself. And that's when he did instructions not included. You know, two or three or four years later, you know, that's, that's what I, I, I want to do, Stephanie. You know, if I inspire a little bit of Henio the best 
to, to do that, it shows me that even actors who have a name, they're having it hard. Yeah. And I'm like, wow. Like, so I should not feel that bad about me, you know? Absolutely. Well, and, go ahead. I'm sorry. And then guess what happened? He did instructions not included, and it was a phenomenon. Yeah. Huge. Why the why the big producers, the big studios didn't see that and explode it? You know, bringing more stories. That was the time to do it, and they didn't do it. Absolutely. Well. Um, I was watching a, an interview from of Rita Moreno many years ago, and she talked about her immediate post success with West Side Story and how obviously, you know, it was such a huge deal. And we know that she's, you know, this decorated, you know, she's an EGOT and, and all of the things um, and how she was so excited. She was telling this in an interview, how she was, of course, so excited about all of those things, um, por supuesto. And she was really looking forward to the next roles that would be offered to her immediately after, you know, West Side Story. She was like, oh, wow, you know, I'm gonna um, hopefully, you know, continue to to be offered these roles that I'm absolutely cap more than capable of, obviously, and, and you know, all those kinds of things. And yeah, the phone rang and she was getting offers. She was getting offers to play the best friend, the slut, the maid, the this, the that. And she's like, I'm sorry, what? What's happening here? And here she is. She'd won an Oscar. She'd won, you know, all these different kinds of things. West Side Story is an iconic, you know, um, piece of art that is forever uh, an influence on me and probably many people watching this. Um, and yet here she is being discounted, being undermined, being insulted by the lines that, uh, excuse me, the roles that are offered to her. And that is so incredibly unacceptable. Um, it's unacceptable for anyone, uh, you know, across the board. It's certainly unacceptable for, you know, Rita Moreno. So, um, man, she went to the Oscars with another actor and they didn't even knew who she was. Right. Knowing that she's Tony Award, a Grammy Award, Oscar, like that for me blew my freaking mind. Absolutely. I was like, she's a freaking icon, a legend. Icon. Exactly. It, it was just, yeah. It, it's it's mind blowing. It really is. Um, you know, what? one thing that, you know, you and I spoke about the other day offline, but I want to share it here, um, is that you know, when we talk about, when we look at these statistics and, and, and the why behind these statistics, that's something I want to take a moment to talk about. Why? Why are these numbers, um, why do they reflect the way that they do? And something that you and I spoke about was the, um, and it goes back to what we spoke about a second ago in terms of that narrow perception and, and characterization of, of Latinos, but um, is that for, you um, Sadly, so many Latinos are not considered American enough to be celebrated um, in similar um, circles and communities as other films, other filmmakers, other actors, just all across the representation. Um, you know, and and in general, off screen or on screen, you know, it's obviously it's a struggle as a Latino. You know, um, I'm not considered Mexican enough for reasons A, B, and C. I'm not considered Latina enough because of reasons A, B, and C. Um, English is my first language. Spanish is my learned language. Um, I taught myself Spanish as a, because as a singer, I wanted to. Uh, I taught myself through through Selena lyrics and and you know other, <laughs> other things like that. You know, so does that make me less Latina? Does that make me any less Latina because um, I'm third generation American? Because um, you know whatever. But it's it's because of these these narrow um, descriptions and definitions um, that we we find ourselves bound. Um, you know, and, and so, so what would you say to, um, to that, you know, do you feel, um, how do you feel about that? Um, I'm not a third generation. <laughs> um, I, I, I just, I just feel that um, what our, our past history has taught us over and over and over again, it comes again to acknowledging people's work, right? How much you acknowledge or where is the competition? Are we gonna be, if we give this opportunity to someone then we're gonna be less, mm. you know? And, um, and 
for so many generations, there's been this frightening, I think mm -hmm. is the word, to share who we are. Like in, a, in, in my documentary, I find out about Gomez, a sergeant who was of, of, of the same caliber as Jorge Otero, right? He, he will never speak Spanish. And so many soldiers that spoke Spanish were mad at him. But we had to understand that that's what he was taught, that if you spoke the language, you will be in trouble. Yes. Right? Yes. And even though we're the largest minority, there's still discrimination, Stephanie, you know? And, and we go again to how can we change this? Absolutely. You know? And I think really it's to tell those stories that are I hidden. think so too to tell those stories that are hidden and, and make them feel proud, you know, show how proud we are of them, of what they went through. Yeah. You know, my sister, it's an engineer, you know, she speaks English more than Spanish. She speaks, you know, a little bit of Spanish, but you know, it's, it is another generation, like the millennium generation, you know, kind of, yeah has a different way of seeing things now these days that I think this is the opportunity. Is the opportunity for change because yeah. they're giving us an opportunity, right? Yeah. But now it's about those those people in power that can give us that opportunity because yeah. Stephanie, we can try, 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 but if you don't have those connections, how do you get there? Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. And then, only thing I think we can get there is people, if you're listening to me, <laughs> uh, I'm here, send me your stories. Yes. Like, let, let's, let's talk, let's get the, yes. let's yes. get the communication going because Absolutely. I think that's the only way we can let other people know about us. Like Salma okay. Hayek, how long it took Salma Hayek to talk about Frida and make her film about Frida, yeah. Yeah. you know? And I'm just like, why? <laughs> Um, I, I, I just think, you know, um, I, I hope that we, we, we filmmakers can really, uh, don't just make movies for making movies, you know, yeah. like, let's really do a research. Let's really find those stories yeah. that are good for all of us. I love that. that. Our culture that right. shows who we are. Absolutely. And, and yes, of course, nobody's perfect. Nobody, nobody, you know, there's bad people, there's good people, there's sure. evil, there's, you know, it, it's going to sure. happen. But I think now the producers, if you're hearing me, producers, directors, writers, come on, let's do it. We can do it. And I think that's let's the only way we can, we can make it happen. I agree. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, speaking of those different roles, you know, the, the writers, the directors, the, you know, um, all of the different roles besides acting that we already talked about. I want to share a little bit of this information that I thought was was really interesting. Um, when a Latino director was attached to a film, the percentage of Latino characters on screen climbed from that four percent to thirteen percent. The thirteen that may may not seem really high, but boy, it's better than four. So when yes, a Latino director, yeah, exactly. When a Latino director was associated with a film, the representation of Latino characters climbed from 4% to 13%. When a, when a Latino producer was attached to a film, the percentage of Latino characters on screen climbed from 4% to 9%. When a Latino casting director was attached to a film, the percentage of Latino characters on screen climbed from 4% to 10%. So when we repeat representation matters, which by the way, uh, if you follow me on social media at Stephanie Levos, everywhere where there's social media, um, I'm always posting things about representation matters because it does. Um, but what I find very poignant in the information that I just shared, the research that I did, is that when we repeat representation matters, we're clearly claiming that visibility is vital. And I would also echo with resounding um, relevance that representation reflects. So if representation matters, then we have to find a way to become visible, authentically visible, and then reflect. Um, and so I, you know, that's why it's so important to do things like, to be involved with things like 
this film festival, like the Film Institute that's a part of the festival, um, you know, building a future and, and um, equipping our young filmmakers with the resources that they need to, to share these stories, um, because that's the only way that these numbers change, Melissa, right? It's the only way that these numbers change is to build the next generation of Latino filmmakers, again, across the board from screenwriting to post-production and everything in between. That's the only way we change our stories is to get us in those places um, to tell our stories and to, um, you know, not only help each other, of course, we want to help each other. That's what this conversation is very much about. But also, um, you know, just just we want our own accurate reflection portrayed on, on, on screen. You know, that's just it's a it's a huge piece of of, of right what we now. do and why we do it. And right now, Stephanie, I, I can tell you there's a lot of Latinas with power and money. Trust those guys. We got you. Like like you right now. Like yeah. Everything needs money, Stephanie. You yes. know, you don't have the money, you cannot do it, to sure. be honest. Sure. You know, like I have I have made my uh, films with the with the five hundred dollar camera, my documentary, right? If I had the support of someone that believed in my project, that you know, then it would look way better. Yeah, you know, that's what I have been seeing in festivals. Like you see people that already have companies and money behind them, and it's wow. And then you see someone like me, passionate with the story that's incredible. But then you look at it and you're like, if you only had a little bit more money. Yeah, can you, you imagine? Would, right. Yes. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Melissa, well, so I want to shift the latter part of our conversation into what I think is um, probably the most important piece of, um, of having you with us, particularly this year, um, as always, and we always thank you for your support. I want to talk about the role of gender in filmmaking, particularly being a Latina. Um, I'll share very briefly that while we know that the male to female ratio of film directors is 20 to one, it's important to know that of 112 directors of 2019 movies, two were Latina. Of 112 directors of, two, of 2019 um, movies, only two were Latina. Of 53 Latino directors working across a 13 year time frame, one out of every 1,000 335 film directors is Latina. So over the course of 13 years, almost 1350 films, um, one is Latina. What do you say to that besides hello glass ceiling? Um, you know, it's not just about being Latina, it's about being woman, you know, and it's it about being gay too. You know, like, like it comes to the point like I'm gay, I'm woman, and I'm Latina. Holy cow, right? Right. <laughs> right. And I, I think people, I'm sorry to say this, but they have to stop seeing us as um as a piece of meat, you know, yeah. and start taking us serious. Of course. You know, because through my career trying to make movies, uh, there was always um the a little high the harassment you know yes. if you do this you know you can be up here you know I went to I went to Miami and you know it, it was uh for my film Shutter Mind with someone with a lot of money bought me a ticket I'm not gonna you know go too much into detail sure. but then <laughs> It, he, you know, uh, he tricked me, right? But I knew I had to tell my mom where I was, everybody where I was, because Melissa Sue, who trusts people, you know, right. that they mean well and they believe in you and your project, and then you get there, and then it's it's totally nothing, you know. Uh, it's really sad. Like it's really sad, and I, I believe us women, right? I'm not gonna even say Latina. I'm sorry. Sure. Us women deserve to be respected for our craft, for our talent. And now because, you know, we all not have beautiful faces, beautiful bodies, but it's still for some reason, there's that insinuation, you know? I, I am so proud and I can tell to all women who are fighting, you know, the system, who are their cinematographers, you know, doing the job of men, like, yes. 
we can do it too. Absolutely. We're doing it. I mean, that's the whole thing is yes. we are doing it. We are doing it. Um, no, you're absolutely right. You know, and, and it goes back to, to also, you know, what I said a moment ago about, about the other roles. Well, all the roles. I mean, we just have to find our, our way, um, our way into, into these roles so that we can change the narrative, um, and just not back down. You know, um, I, can't tell you, you know, as an actress, um, how many times I have been just so disheartened by the casting calls that have come across um, my my email, um, and 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 you know what they call for and how little they call for for and and how many times I've gone for roles that maybe were written for somebody who looked differently than me and how few times I was given an opportunity you know, despite that, um, every time that happened, it was, it was amazing and, and worth it. And shout out to those directors and casting directors who gave me a chance to embody a role beyond, um, the stereotypical Latina role, um, you know, and, and that sort of thing. Um, and, and I think it's just, it's, it's really hard. You know, we, we have to believe in, in, um, in the vastness of our characters to Melissa, you know, and, and I think that again, I'm speaking more from the from the role of an actress, but um and for yeah. me, as I have been a producer, director, a writer, you know, I I we it's I cast for what it is, right? I'm a I want it to be as truthful to the story as we as I need to be. A lot of raw and personal in your face things, right? So like we talked before and we come again, society has put us in, in, a, in a bubble that that's who we are and what we do. Right. Right. So casting directors, <laughs> uh, give us an opportunity because there's so many Latino actors that don't have accent, Yeah. you know? There's so many Latino actors that can become whatever you want them to be if you just give them that chance. Please stop just reading. Exactly. And say, come in, you know, come in and show me. Show me. Exactly. You know, no, like, oh, Latina. Uh, exactly. Uh, Melissa Lopez. Ricardo Salazar. Oh, take exactly. them off. I don't want it. No, guys, like. Like now we are in a time that we can be whatever we want to Absolutely. be. Absolutely. And that we can portray whatever we want to portray. Absolutely. You know, one actress said to, uh, she got a hard time <laughs> because uh, she played an Asian character. And she said, guys, if I want to be a tree, I can be a tree. Why not? I'm an actor. I'm an actor. You know? I went to school to to become something that I'm not too. You know what I mean? I I can personificate whoever I want to. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I I think in this point too, casting directors have a lot to do because uh, you know casting directors are the ones who prepare for the director to come to see exactly. Pictures to see videos so I think it starts from there too and right. you know and guess what before casting there's the writing exactly so That's exactly go back to to writing hey guys guess what my name is Melissa Suel Lopez but I'm a singer songwriter I'm a producer I'm a you know I I'm a cinematographer I'm an editor I'm all of these things because I love it. Absolutely. Because I want to be part of it. I want to mm -hmm. be part of the stories. Exactly. So give me a chance. And that's, I think, how we all are. Like, just give us a chance. Absolutely. Before we round out this conversation, I want to um, highlight a couple of things. Um, and then I want to ask you one final question, really. Um, I do think it really goes back to the writing. I, I think it starts with the writing, um, just to kind of piggyback on on what we've been talking about. I mean, all of these roles are so vital, like you said, casting director and, and everything in between, but I really do believe it, it starts at the writing. And I would like to give a shout out to organizations like NALIP, um, National Association of Latino Independent Producers, Nosotros, and other national organizations that exist to, um, to help 
um, Latinos create authentic works of art on screen and do it with integrity and all those kinds of things. I also want to give a shout out to different organizations who are targeting, um, you know, and really wanting to expand with a, an authentic, diverse voice, um, you know, their writing. You know, I know Disney offers fellowships and just different, different groups and organizations, and I don't want to exclude anyone who's doing great work and um but i just want to say that you know i really appreciate that i appreciate the resources that that are out there and all of those who serve you know on those boards and in just different um, points yeah. of leadership speaking of leadership i think that the responsibility also comes from corporations if i can be very candid i want to share a recent story really quickly I was recently um, approached about doing a project and I really appreciated the candor of the individual who contacted me. He was very honest and said, listen, um, you know, I'm just going to be really blunt with you. I am um, seeking talent that fills these different minority group boxes. And that's what I'm doing here. And that's why I'm asking you to submit for this role. And I appreciated his candor. And I've been asked that many times. I've had that conversation many times. And I submitted multiple pieces of work for this potential opportunity, um, ranging across the board from my animation voice to my English you know, uh, forward voice to my Spanish accent forward voice, multiple languages, you know, a different, a, a wide variety. Um, because like you said, you know, we wear many hats and can can do different things depending upon what you're needing from us. And um, I was not selected and um, he did not give me feedback. And I obviously assume positive intent and there's no hard feelings whatsoever. But it reminded me, I'm sharing this story only because it reminded me of several previous incidents um, where the exact same thing had happened. And in those cases, not in this last would have been in those previous ones, the um, contact was very candid with me and said, you didn't sound ethnic enough. You didn't sound ethnic enough. And so that's why we, you know, the client or the casting director or whoever, you know, decided to go in a different direction. And Melissa, I would like to tell you that that happened to me 20 years ago, and it did. I'd like to tell you that that happened 11 years ago, and it did. I wish I couldn't tell you that it happened 11 weeks ago, but it did. And that's unacceptable. That's unacceptable. Um, there are other things that are unacceptable in terms of um, asking talent to translate things and basically write their own script. I'm sorry, if a major company comes to me and wants me as their talent, um, they're not going to just give me bullet points of data and ask me to write my own script. They're going to have someone on staff who is going to write this comprehensive script in the language in which it's consumed. It's going to be relevant and it's going to be all those kinds of things. Why in the world would you ask me to write my own script? P.S. Spanish is, as I shared, you know, is not my first language. It's my learned language. I can do things scripted. Regardless, I do not consider myself a script writer, you know, a writer of any kind in Spanish. So you're, you're making a poor assumption. I'm not going to give it integrity. I like, I wouldn't do it even if it was, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's not my lane. I'm going to be very, very honest about that. And I'm not saying that people can't, can't straddle both of those lanes. I'm absolutely aware that I have very talented colleagues who do all of those things and more and congrats to them. And yes, please do that if that's within your um, skill set and your wheelhouse, but make sure you're getting paid for it. That's my whole point is you want me to provide translation services for free and then carry it out. And, you know, there's just so much unprofessionalism that's coming from, from corporations, businesses and organizations um, and assumptions that are being made about how the Latinos in the entertainment industry are going to engage based upon those limited um, opportunities that you're providing for us. Like we're supposed to just be so hungry and chomping at the bit that, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it just to, get, just to get a chance. I would also like to lie to you and tell you that I didn't do that in my early career, but that would be a lie, Melissa. I did. In my earliest days, I was just so hungry and thirsty to do work that I was willing to do work for free, not just in like the literal sense of what you think of doing work for free, but, but things like that, those additional services of sure, I'll translate it. Sure. I'll do whatever. And I'll, it's unacceptable, not only because you're asking for free labor, but, but because you didn't already have someone in leadership, um, 
on your staff, on your team, who was making sure that that script was written for a Spanish audience to make sure that it was consumed in a relevant, meaningful, respectful way. That's the, that's the real issue. That's the real problem. Not just the assumptions that you made and, and the ask that you made that was unprofessional. It's that you didn't already, you know, you weren't already sensitive and cognizant of that from the get-go when you decided, hey, we want to find an actor who will, you know, do this in Spanish or, or for our Latin audience or whatever. So and, and, we just have to hold everybody accountable, right? And that's where it comes that now they want it easy. Now people want it easy. Don't do the work. Don't pay other people. They will do it. Like you said, because yes, we're hungry, but hey, we deserve respect. Absolutely. And, and um, I'm glad you didn't do it. That's where people need to stop. No. Yes. You know, I had a friend in photography uh, who keeps saying, why people think because I'm Latina, I have to do, you know, cobrar poquito. Right. Why? I'm a professional photographer. Why I charge $3,000? Why they want me to charge the $300? Yes. Like, but if a Blanquito came or an American or someone else came, they, uh, they pay them. And I'm like, and then when you're talking about your accent and everything, is the ignorance of people that only Latinos speak Spanish. Right. And only Latinos live in their countries and then they come right. to learn the English. Like, that is what is wrong right now. Right. Absolutely. You grew up here. I have my best friend who grew up here. You know, she speaks fluent English without any accent. Right. And, and it goes back to ignorance. I, yeah. I just... But, you know, is it, my question is, is it us to have to educate them? Right. Well, there's responsibility all across the board, you know, mm -hmm. all across the board. I do have to say one quick thing, and then I want to ask you our final question. Yes. Um, I do love, I do love it when, when situations work out like this. One of the roles that I played that, um, the entire piece, I, uh, I spoke with a soft Mexican influenced Spanish accent. Um, I love that that entire piece of work, um, I was portraying a character who was a doctor. So incredibly well educated. And I loved that, that I was able to give, um, to marry, hopefully, that characterization of this extremely intelligent, fine, fine doctor who also spoke with an accent and she was equally capable and powerful and amazing. And, you know, so I, I love it when roles like that, but that goes back to the writing, right? The author wrote that character as this strong, beautiful, amazing, powerful doctor, you know, and, and encompassing all of these things, including her heritage, reflecting her heritage. And, and it comes to, to my project, the one I'm working, right? Yeah. Um, uh, we want a male soldier narrating this or very firm and very like for museum for this and for that. And I'm like, uh, but a man didn't do this research, you know, a man didn't took two years to really go dig into this. Mm -hmm. Why us women had to give that up for men to do it because that's why everybody is used to. Yeah. Let's, let's do this guys. Let's change the talk. A woman has a firm voice. Yeah. A woman has that voice that inspires. Yes. A woman has that voice of passion. You don't have to be a male to be strong. Absolutely. This. Absolutely. A woman with just a look can show you what is being strong. Mm -hmm. What is, you know, like, and that is when me as a creator, yes, right? I said, no. Mm -hmm. That's when we talk about the leadership. That's right. I said, I want a woman's voice. I want a voice to narrate this freaking amazing story of a sergeant who gave the life for his soldiers. Mm -hmm. Everything he did was for his soldiers. Do you know what a mother does for his kids? Mm -hmm. What a mother does for her husband? 
Yeah. You know, what a mother, like even not just a mother, any, even an animal, like, you yeah. know, we're the protect, like we protect as the same. We're e like, you know, there's, like, let's go for that equality, guys. Absolutely. You know, I want to end with that. Please. Let's go for equality. I'm not just a name. I'm not just a color. Mm -hmm. I'm not just a gender. Yes. You know, look beyond my eyes and see what I can offer you. You know, that's how I want to end this because let's stop of being afraid of who we are. Mm -hmm. Let's stop of being afraid of what people are going to think about us. You know, let's stop being afraid of what may happen. Absolutely. Let's live the present and, and, and go for it with, with that stand, with their, uh, our chin up. No matter who you are, woman, man, whatever you are, you know, uh, let's make a difference together in community. It is. When you talk about organizations, you know, I, I, I ask those organizations to support, you know, and not just monetary, like right. they're doing, you know, they're doing uh, sessions, you know, like continue doing that, guys. And when you see something, go for it too. Don't be afraid of what other people are going to think. Guys, I'm fighting for a medal of honor. I'm fighting for a Valor's Unit Award to people that they took their value away and gave it to someone else. Mm. You know, it, 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 it's just, it's going to be tough. I'm not going to tell you it's going to be easy, but sometimes the toughest at the end, man, if it happens, it's awesome. <laughs> Absolutely. Melissa, thank you so much for sharing your, your personal stories and your encouragement and the message that you're that you're leaving with our audience is so important and I just really appreciate you sharing it um you know your voice carries so much weight Melissa and and by the way audience if you don't already or if you're not already as familiar with Melissa Sue Lopez's work I encourage you to get to know her um get to know her works get to know her passions on an even deeper level um and I, and I agree a thousand percent. It is about equality for all marginalized. Um, we have to advocate for, for each other. I've been doing a lot of research recently on allyship, and that's a, a path I want to continue um, going down. Um, and equality as well as equity. You know, it, going back to that, um, you know, the idea of, you know, if you uh, build a longer table, you know, and that sort of thing. And, and, just that whole idea of, of building building equity along with equality um, is so important. Um, thank you so much for your time and your talent and your passion, um, particularly as you have served the Oklahoma City Latino film community by serving as a judge. We are so honored um, to have you with us and, and to just help our community grow. It's so exciting that the Oklahoma City film community is thriving and growing. And so oh, I heard a new studio. Oh my goodness. There's, There's like so exciting. many things happening. There are. And so we're just excited <laughs> to be to be a part of that and again help build um you know build the film film community here. So thank, uh, you, Ebony, thank you for the interview and I want to say thank you for the Cine Latino. Uh, it is so important, you know uh, to showcase the work of other Latinos, to learn from each other, to know that, you know, it can happen. And thank you for giving us a voice, yeah. you know, for so many years, for so many decades, we haven't had the opportunity to have this. So for me, I just want to thank the Cine Latino Film Festival for allowing me just to, to share a little bit of me and, you know, to hopefully, I, you know, the only thing I always wanted to do with my career is to encourage others, you know, that to be an example at one point or another and, and be an inspiration that guys, if, if I'm able to do this, you can too. Absolutely. Yes. And just huge shout out to Rogelio Almeida, who is just the, the godfather, the grandfather, the, the, the padre of, of everything. Okay. Cine Latino, um, you know, it's all because of his passion and his hard work and his leadership and, um, and all of that. So 
Well, Melissa Sue, thank you again so much. I look forward to continuing to hear all the wonderful things that are going on with your career. Much love to you and your family. Um, and we just look forward to, um, to the future for all of us. Thank you so much, Seth. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.